Hello, everyone, and welcome to Meet a Scientist, sponsored by New Mexico EPSCoR. I'm your host today, Allison Brody, uh, for the Explorer Science Center in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And today we have Dr. Magdalena Sandoval Donahue. She's a geoscientist and owner of Think Ubiquitous, a software technology company. And uh, so happy to have you joining us today. Um, Magdalena, let's start with the fact that you are a geoscientist. Can you tell us uh, what types of things a geoscientist does? Yeah, thanks, Allison. Um, geoscientists or geologists, we do all kinds of things, all a huge range of activities and interests and occupations. So everything from looking at rocks and how they formed and how they came to be, to um, the processes that go on on the Earth's surface. So things like volcanoes and earthquakes and floods and that kind of thing, to looking for natural resources. So that includes oil and gas, um, the minerals and heavy metals that we use in everyday technology uses and car batteries and building materials, all of those require um, sourcing some sort of natural resource. There's also um, another important resource, especially here in New Mexico, uh, water. Okay. So there's a whole branch of geoscience that's under the realm of hydrology. So where does our water come from? How do we get it? How do we use it? How do we clean it? How do we conserve it? Um, that kind of branch. And then there's also the whole branch of, of um, what's called remote sensing, which kind of generally falls under the umbrella of geoscience. Um, but so how do we measure and monitor our Earth and our atmosphere? And we can even extend it to space if we wanted to stretch the geoscientist definition. But um, so how do we monitor you know, our rain clouds and our pollution and our air currents and our ocean currents and all of that falls under uh, remote sensing. So we have a lot of people who work with satellites and then a lot of people who do mapping and digital technologies like that. So how do we make maps that are up to date and how do we, you know, display the information that, you know, these scientists have. Um, so there's a huge range of things that geologists or geoscientists do above the earth, on the earth, underneath the earth's surface. There's, you know, how do we, it's, it's all kinds of things. Right. And you were talking about like, how do you display the information, uh, like the data, <laughs> which is something that scientists engage with, right? Data. Um, but you're also interested in art. Tell us how you combine those two. Yeah, um, so there's so there's so many ways to think about combining science and art, or science and visualization, or how do we look at data, and how do we make that information make sense to somebody, whether you're trained as a scientist or whether you're looking at something for the very first time. Um, and one of the ways that I am particularly interested in it is using Earth data sets. So things like measurements of the ocean salinity or looking at photographs of what are called thin sections. So we take a rock, we slice it up super thin, and you shine a light through it, and under the correct conditions, we can see all the minerals and they light up and they're beautiful. They're red and purple and golden and different shapes. And so we can look at those minerals or crystals in a very artistic way. So for me, I do that by turning those shapes and images into fabric and then making apparel, so making clothing out of those different, um, those different patterns. And I have everything from, yeah, oceans to rivers that we've, mon we've measured using LIDAR, so using lasers that fly around in an airplane to, to measure rivers to, um, yeah, different mineral structures and all these things that are just very beautiful. And then potentially, you know, how does that appeal and how does that cross over into patterns that we would wear every day? So that's what I do. But I do, I have a background in art. I started, I started um, my studies in college as an artist. So that's yeah. so cool. 
That's so cool. And this idea that um, how we represent the world around us in that artistic way, but you can still understand things are going around in uh, happening in science. Yeah, and it's important. It's important to really realize that there are, you know, some very set ways that scientists really like to display data, whether that's on a bar chart or a graph chart or on a time series with some wiggles that go through. But there's also a whole lot of importance in looking at how kind of how do we work to translate that information into something that makes sense to someone who's not a scientist or has never looked at, say, earthquake data or something like that. So how can we communicate that and bridge that? Because a lot of the information is really important. And it's really, as we, you know, kind of move forward to try to understand and broaden the impact of science, it's important to have that communication open. And so data visualization, the entire kind of idea of visualizing data is really, really important. And as we have more and more data every single day, coming in at us from all over everything, we have to figure out ways to, to sort that out. So, yeah. So you're a scientist, you're an artist, and now you're also an entrepreneur. You have your own company. Tell us yeah. what it's like to run a business. <laughs> well, it's really different. It, I had to talk about like an eternal learning curve. Um, you know, I was in school for a long time. I went to graduate school and things like that. And, and then I just, I decided I, with my husband, actually, we would start a company together and we would go into a whole nother realm that combined our two kind of strengths and interests, which are software and, um, geoscience or environmental science. And so we dove off and decided to start a company. The the reality is it's really, really different from doing pure scientific research. There is a whole lot of, you know, other nuances as to how businesses operate and how things um, work, even just logistically, like how do you set up a company and how do you, what resources do you have access to or what registrations do you need to do? Um, how do you find people who, kind of want this idea of what you're making and trying to source out all that information. So there's, there is a huge and I think constant evolving set of questions that come into my mind and I have to do, you know, a whole nother kind of research and read different books and look at different, you know, online magazines and things like that. And so happily I've had some great partners here in Albuquerque who have um, been really of huge assistance and have given really, really big, um, you know, tons of advice and tons of information as to, okay, these are the basics of what you need to know. Okay, this is where you can go do that. These are people who do something kind of similar, and so maybe you could talk to them if you have questions. Um, and, uh, and it involves just a whole nother level of networking and being willing to take a lot of risk and being able to be you know, you go through school and you advance, 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 and then you think you're kind of done with that, and you go on to the next thing, and then suddenly it's like you're back in kindergarten, and you have to learn everything all over again. And so, um, so it's a lot of fun. It's a really big challenge. It's a lot of fun. Um, it's it's really different, and it's really a fun way. I think most importantly, it's a really fun way to apply science or to apply a skill in a whole brand new way whether that's in a new arena or to different group of people or if it's an entirely new product that you're dreaming up um, and so being able to be excited about that and then to you know being willing especially with something like developing software um, or developing new tools that have never been built before wow. um, you know, it's important to be able to be curious about it and be kind of persistent in saying, I think this idea could work. I don't, no one has done this before. I don't know how it might work. So we're going to try going this way and then we'll try going that way. We'll try going that way. And when, you know, you do that like 10 times, sometimes it gets really old and you get discouraged. But then you have to realize, okay, well, 
maybe you just keep trying a little bit more. <laughs> so maybe try a different angle. Right. And um, so it's really iterative. It's a really iterative learning process. And so apart from all the logistics, there's the actual kind of product development and then customer development and all these right. things that you don't ever get a, you know, at least for me, I didn't go to business school, never took a business class. You know, I had never, I'd never even heard of most of these terms when I, when I started. Right. So dive in. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. So what does it mean to you to be a scientist? You know, all these different career pathways that you've taken, uh, how would you answer what it takes to be a scientist? <laughs> well, I think the biggest thing about being a scientist is that there is like no one straight pathway. And I think there is, there is a idea that there's a very clear cut educational pathway and an educational process. You go through grade school and high school and then you go to college and then you go to graduate school and then you maybe go to more graduate school and then you're a scientist. But I think in terms of my experience and my process, yes, I, had a, I did have a constant progression, especially through education. I, I went through high school and then I went to college and then I took a little break and then I went and did my master's uh, program and then I took a break and I was a professional runner for a year and then I worked for an environmental consulting company so I used the skills that I had from my master's degree and did environmental remediation which is another branch of geoscience I didn't even talk about but we did clean up from you know environmental uh like environmentally contaminated sites so i did some of that for a little while and then i went back and decided maybe this isn't for me and still really curious and back to graduate school again i went and then um continued on that way and then finally i i finished and i i finished my phd and i thought well you know that why not try to apply some of this into a business setting and see what we can do in that way. And so, so instead of, you know, a very straight pathway, that was a very circuitous one. Along the way, I had a couple kids and got married and moved around the country several times. And so there's a lot of, of switching. The thing that I think is constant throughout that is that there's a constant curiosity and a constant kind of desire to be exploring something new and to be, at least for me, I get kind of antsy or kind of stag, you know, kind of uncomfortable with feeling that I was just stagnating. And I'd start to feel like, I don't know, like I needed to rearrange the furniture in my house or something, except that I was rearranging the career trajectory that I was going on. And so happily, you know, I've been able to do that. But for me, I think every time I turned one of those pathways, even though it was something that it was like, well, maybe this didn't work out, or this wasn't my favorite part of it, or I'm getting kind of bored with this, you have to ask, okay, so why am I bored with this? Or why do I think this isn't working? Or you know, what, what is dissatisfying me with this in some way? And then think creatively, okay, so how can I solve this problem? And what are the many ways to do it? And there's, you know, the one next logical step, or there's like, okay, I need to step over here and go this direction for a while, and do something like that. And from each of those steps comes in a new experience and a whole lot more information and a little more perspective. And so for me, to be a scientist is like the gaining of perspective after perspective after perspective. So experience upon experience upon experience. And for me, that makes it, you know, that makes being a scientist much more interesting and much more, uh, just like much more ability, like your, your ability to apply your science and apply the scientific training that you get in school, because that's what you get is training, not you know, full knowledge of your scope of, of, of branch of study. So how do you apply this training in ways that are potentially the most beneficial to 
you or to your society or to your kind of community. And so when you pull all those perspectives and all those experiences together, that to me is what makes a really good scientist. So hopefully I can keep going on that way and eventually one day maybe I'll be a really good scientist. I love that. It's like the, the perfect definition of what lifelong learning looks like uh, in a really fulfilling way that, um, that is uh, a benefit to our community. That's really cool. Yeah, and it's not always easy. I mean, there are better times, there are harder times. It's, sometimes it's exciting and great, and sometimes it's just like slogging through mud, but that's with everything. So you kind yeah. of have to keep going because you know the next thing's coming around the corner. And I also like that there's really no right way to do it. And even if it isn't the way you end up, it doesn't mean it was necessarily wrong. It just means that, okay, I took that path. Now I'm going to try something else. Exactly. So an important aspect of, uh, of any career pathway. Yeah. And the thing, like the beauty of that is that you never know when that's going to come in useful, right? Mm -hmm. It could be useful tomorrow and immediate or useful today. And it might be useful or it might be something that you tap on in 10 or 15 years. And I know definitely, you know, some of the contacts and, and friendships and experiences that I had when I was 20 or in college, you know, I'm now coming back to 20 years later and, you know, or 15 years later or 10 years later that, that are really, really important at the time, which maybe I, absorbed and stored somewhere back here and it took a long time for that next experience to kind of come in and say aha this is the perfect thing for yeah. right now and you know so it's that cumulative experience that I think is so important nice well I think our time is up thank you so much Magdalene that was so good and um we'll uh we'll talk soon thanks so much Allison